Have you ever done anything for someone that you love? That other people found embarrassing, but you just didn't care? Have you ever, ever become so focused on someone that you love, that you've actually forgotten that other people are watching you? And you don't care that they're watching you. And if you have, I suggest to you that at that moment, only one person's opinion mattered to you at that time. Above everybody else's opinion, only that one person's opinion mattered. And whose opinion is that? And it's the opinion of the one that you love above all others. Do you know, I remember the first time that I was aware of this in my own life. And it happened to me in my 20s. I was holding my 18-month-old daughter, Anna, uh, in a long queue of a very busy post office. And now you might ask, didn't I have a buggy or a pram to put her in rather than carrying her? And the answer is yes, yes, I did. But she was so restless, probably hungry, that she just wouldn't stay in the buggy without crying. And I thought about leaving the post office, coming back at another time, another date. But what I needed to do in the post office couldn't wait for another day. So I picked her up and I tried to comfort and distract her so that she would stop crying. Uh, I tried to soothe her with gentle words. And when that didn't work, I pulled funny faces. I made funny noises. I even jumped up and down a bit. I did impressions of a chicken and a horse and a pig, a sheep, a cow. Do you all know old MacDonald had a farm? <coughs> and I completely forgot myself as I was doing this. I forgot about my image. I wasn't conscious of anyone else. It was the first time it happened to me. Anna had stopped crying by now and was distracted. She had begun smiling a bit. And maybe she had forgotten she was hungry for a few minutes. The long queue got shorter and shorter and I just nudged the buggy along, doing my best. But everything I was doing was to entertain Anna. I only had eyes for her. And as I said, probably for the first time in my life, in my 20s, I hadn't noticed other people's reactions. And I didn't mind what other people thought of me. And afterwards when we were leaving, I noticed some people smiling. But others kept a straight face and gave me some strange looks as I left the post office. But it was a turning point for me. I would never be the same again. And becoming a father, having Anna, changed me. Because of my love for this little girl, my self-image didn't matter so much that day. It was her attention and it was her delight that I was after. Can you relate to this, some of you? Brothers and sisters, becoming an adopted son, an adopted daughter of God, God the Father, it should change us. We are never the same again. You know, it it is a turning point for us. And surely it's his attention, it's his delight that we're after. It, It isn't anyone else's. The Lord becomes the number one love of our lives. We love our families, but we love him more. He's our life. He's our strength. He's our redeemer. He he loves us the most. And we listen to our family members' opinions, of course. 
But the Lord's opinion matters far more. His opinion carries far more weight. He knows more. He's the author of life. The scripture says he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Which brings us to the scripture for this morning. Brief background. King David is celebrating before the Lord. He's worshipping God with the other Israelites. Many of them big men. Many of them big fighting men who can wield a sword and have probably killed many people in battle. These are men's men. Um, we may not have those kind of worries, warriors t- today, but you might think of, think of people working in the pit. Strong men, big muscles, big weights, hard work. They're used to difficult conditions. They're worshipping God with David because David was leading them. He was King David. And they were worshipping because they were bringing the ark to Jerusalem. And in the ark was the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. And it was a day of rejoicing. So that's the background. Um, Michal, who I'll refer to as we go, is one of his wives. She's the daughter of Saul that he replaced as king. So I'm skipping some verses in order to keep it to the point. So here we go. This is 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 5. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord. All their might. With castanets. I don't know if we know what castanets are. There's a little... Yeah, you sometimes see them in the Spanish dancing, the flamenco, the piece of wood. With castanets, with harps. With lyres. Lyres is an instrument with strings. Probably an early version of the guitar. Timbrels. Um, sistrums, which are like at rattles almost. And cymbals. We know the percussion. We don't have them here, but in most bands you have the percussion of the drums, won't you? They're worshipping with all their might before the Lord. David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom... To the city of David with rejoicing. City of David being Jerusalem. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed the bull and a fatted calf. Wearing a linen ephod, it was like a it was like a uh, a linen outfit that the priests used to wear. So he's wearing wearing something very plain and white, linen ephod. David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. This is the man's man, David, with all his men. Women, of course, but I'm I'm just focusing on the men for now. While he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Jerusalem, Michal, daughter of Saul, his wife, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said, how, how the king has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked, In full view of the slave girls of his servants. The slave girls of his servants. As any vulgar fellow would, she says. David said to Michal. It was before the Lord. Who chose me rather than your father or anyone else from his house. When he appointed me ruler. Over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate. Before the Lord. I will become. Even more undignified. Than this. And I will be humiliated. In my own eyes he says. But by these slave girls. That you spoke of he says. 
I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. We'll come on to that. You know, when Michal took issue with her husband David about how expressive that he had been in his worship and celebration, did David say, okay, my love, I'll try and tone it down in future. I'll, I'll try my best to, I'll damp it down a bit. And of course, David loved his wife. But he loved the Lord more. He loved his wife, but he loved the Lord more. Michal was concerned with appearances. What would people think of him? She was embarrassed by her husband. So what did David say to her? He said it was before the Lord that he did this. Verse 21. In other words, it was for him. It was for no one else. It was for him. But he didn't stop there. He said, I will celebrate before the Lord. Verse 21. He's making sure that Michal, his wife, understands, look, this is not a one-off. I didn't slip up and forget myself when I was expressing myself so freely. It wasn't a mistake. I know what I'm doing. It's intentional. I will celebrate before the Lord. And David wasn't ashamed of his God. He wasn't ashamed of worshipping his God. In fact, perhaps, perhaps to her horror, David tells Michal that not only is he not going to stop celebrating before the Lord, it's going to look more undignified. I will be more undignified than this, he says. If you, if you thought this was bad, it's going to get more undignified. In other words, I will look even more foolish than what you've seen today. And Michal wasn't necessarily against the worship of God. She was concerned that it wasn't a good look for a king. To take off his kingly robes. To behave like just some of the common people. It's alright for them maybe. What about his reputation? What about his image? She thought less of him. He went down in her estimation. She thought less of her husband because of the freedom with which he was worshipping God. His God. And the scriptures tell us that, verse 16, she despised him in her heart. And in verse 23, as I said, we're told that Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. And in the society of those times, in many societies, it was a source of disgrace for a woman not to have children, as we know. It seems here that there was a consequence for Michal despising her husband for worshipping the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to worshipping God, at our Sunday morning gatherings, we need to be free of our inhibitions in how we worship. We need to be free of any concerns about what anybody else might think of you. Of course, we will always be different to each other. We get that. We're all different in our expression of worship. But each of us knows that point inside when we're holding back. We can feel that moment inside when we're not, we're not going for it. And it's a challenge for me too. Please don't think otherwise. It's a challenge for me too. You know, I, <clears throat> just to encourage you that worship takes many forms. When I was 17, I hadn't given my life to the Lord at the time. I was in an ancient church in the mountains of Trudos in Cyprus. 
And don't, don't ask me why, I, I can only think it was the Lord prompting me. I got up at 7am in the morning to go to this morning service and my youngest brother said, if you're going, I'll come with you. 17. Uh, everyone watched us troop in with shorts, bleary-eyed. And uh, I just wanted to see what, what it was like. And uh, I remember seeing things I'd never seen before. Like there was, a, there was a, a man who spent the whole service face down on the floor. It just uh, still. For the whole service. People sat, sat down, stood up, etc. He just stayed there. People sang. They were speaking. He sat there. Some people did the sign of the cross. He just, he just he lay face down. Another woman was doubled over on her knees, just rocking like that, crying from the beginning to the end of the service. And I remember it had an impact on me at 17. I, I still hadn't given my life to the Lord, but I thought, these people believe. These people believe. It's real for them. I hadn't seen it before. That's when you forget yourself and you worship the Lord. It isn't all about leaping and dancing. It's worshipping the Lord authentically in spirit and in truth not caring who sees and what they think David had no fear of man and this is not just about a fear of violent men that's not what we're talking about alone David had no fear of the opinions of other people and in Proverbs 29 verse 25 it says the fear of man will prove to be a trap for you and for me. We can't afford to have a fear of man's opinion if we're going to live this life. It's a bold life. It's courageous. I wish more men would see what this faith is about. A faith that was led by men. We, the, the, the scriptures, But you know, women have carried the load for years. And we're praying for a sea change not just here, but throughout Scotland. But let's start here. The Lord Jesus says, whoever's ashamed of me, and whoever's ashamed of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory. It's quite sobering. Luke 9, verse 26. This is, this is Jesus' own words. You know, in Scotland, there's a proud tradition of song and dance, isn't there? Many of us are happy to jump up and have a turn at a Cayley, I am. Yeah? Some of you have some experience of Highland dancing. And many of us, men and many women, are happy to raise our hands and our voice as we support our team. Yes, we need order in church. But not a stifling order that stifles people. We need to be free to worship. It's a freedom that comes from the Lord. The Lord says you have permission to be free to worship. We have permission to be free to worship. You know, nearly 30 years ago, when we were looking for a church fellowship at the time to become part of, I prayed. And I was a bit challenged because everyone was saying to me, Chris, what, are you looking for a church? There's loads of churches. People that weren't believers said to me, Chris, you want to go to a church? Well, there's loads of churches. But there's one, I, I know one. That, and so I thought, I need to be specific in what I'm praying for. And I felt the Lord lead me to pray for three things. And I'm going to share them with you now. Nearly 30 years ago, about 28 years ago, I sat down and I thought, Lord, what am I asking for? There are churches everywhere. People are right. What am I looking for? Why don't I just go to... These are the three things. Lord, take us to a place, me and my family, where everyone's a believer. It's not too much to ask, Lord. Number two. Lord, take us to a place, a church, where people don't feel the need... To be clones of each other. I thought that's not too much to ask. People are individuals. And the third thing I prayed. Was Lord. Take us to a church fellowship. Where there's a freedom. Of worship. 
And by God's grace, he answered that prayer. And we were in the church for 20 years. You know, God here at RBC, Recite Baptist Church, has given us a rich mix of cultures in our midst. And we're blessed as we receive from each other. Living and growing as a church family. The family of God, the body of Christ. With the Lord Jesus as the head of the church. The head of the body, which is what we are. So I'm going to pray a very short prayer and hand over to Alan. Father, this morning, as I hand over to Alan and Jen to lead us in worship, help us, dear Lord, by your Spirit, to worship you with freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.